Okay, this is American Beauty, episode two, part three, and I have with me today, via Zoom, Shannon Bradley from California, Professor Regis Fox from Grand Valley State University in Michigan, and Kimberly Bassford from the University of Hawaii, also an independent filmmaker um, and creator of the film Patsy Mink, Ahead of the Majority. And we're here to talk about democracy <laughs> and about what it means to wake up politically and the changes it, it um, creates in our lives and also how we can draw from the past, right, from some of the long haul um, um, leaders like Patsy Mink, like the African-American women Regis Fox has written about who really understood um, what it was like to live in the challenges um, of, of liberal democracy, who really understood that. So, but first, I want to thank um, Women Make Movies. They are the distributors of Kim's film on Patsy Mink, which everyone should see. You can get it at their website, but they are going to help us promote this, and we are happy to give them a boost because since 1972, they've been supporting women filmmakers um, in making incredible movies about um, justice and democracy and human dignity. So, really glad to have them on board. And with that, Shannon. <laughs> Are you so glad you retired? You retired and left your day job and dove full uh, time into the work. Oh, I am. It was a big deal to leave. I mean, I worked at the university for twenty five years, and I talked to you early on when I was just making the decision and going public with that. And when I listened to that conversation, some of the things we talked about seem so quaint now. I mean, things have gotten so much worse. Right. And I don't, I'm not alone. I'm meeting people all the time who have made very similar decisions to engage in a way they never have because things have gotten that bad. So personally, it's been liberating and fun for me to work on campaigns. I, I'm working, I'm volunteering for a Democrat who's running in an open seat here in California that looks good and talking to voters and getting over my fear of offending people by and I was trained on how to talk to people and it's just been fascinating I feel like I'm I've been reborn so I'm really enjoying it well I think that's the greatest takeaway is yeah uh, when we talked early in the summer th there were things that had not happened yet like the family separations we saw yeah. in the summer that were so you just uh, soul destroying but you know you were also still saddled with a lot of anxiety and moving from anxiety into action has been freeing right Yes, it has. Yes, it has. I I know what I'm doing every day, and I do something every day to help what I hope will be uh, rescuing our democracy. Yeah, and were you? And I hope you were able to listen to you know what Professor Fox and yes. Professor Basford talked to us about. What did you draw from the stories they could tell that you've been able to put to work in your own? Oh, activism? I was so inspired. I listened to the first part. Um, there, what what Regis Fox has done, and what and the film on um, Patsy Mink, and I was so inspired by what they've done. And they were trailblazers. I mean, the women that were featured are just incredible. And I feel like what I'm doing is so minor in comparison, but I'm inspired by what they did and the obstacles that they faced and the differences that they made. And I actually overlapped with Congresswoman Mink for a bit you know, when I was on Capitol Hill years ago. And I remember hers and how, you know, how, how um, inspiring she was and how many people were impressed by her. And, you know, she, there was, she always had this hubbub around her. She was, she was quite a, quite a leader. And it was fun to hear that and hear about her and, you know, some of the, her background. And anyway, I really enjoyed both, uh, hearing from both of the women that you interviewed before. And I was listening to some um, Supreme Court confirmation hearings this morning, and I heard the voice of Maisie Hirono, and, um, and it struck me, like, we need Patsy Mink in this moment to remind us of the women that came before. We need Anna Julia Cooper in this moment. We need these names to be in the hashtag resist conversation or in our conversation about how we do democracy, because we're not the first, right? I mean, I want to hear Regis weigh in on, or Professor Fox weigh in on the idea that what you're doing is small, Shannon, you know. Um, Professor Fox, what would the women that you write about say to all of us who feel that we are small? Right. I think this definition, popular definition of resistance as only being one thing is is so limiting, right? So the idea that it has to, you know, reflect a certain type of radicalism, you know, that it must be occupy a certain public forum, um, that it has to be male, right? Or all of these <laughs> things. 
um, severely limit the work that we do. And so when we look back, we can see this history of, um, of people who have always fought back in, in other forms, right, in multiple forms, both and. And so um, thinking about, we've talked about um, this, Joanne and I, about storytelling and about the use of humor and joy and um, all of these other, sarcasm, right, all of these other forms um, that sometimes we're able to, to retrieve through literature, but there are just multiple ways in which power can be contested and only serves, I think, the dominant group, right? When we when we say, well, my 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 way of fighting back, of pushing back, is inauthentic um, and unimportant. So we have to keep doing all of these things, the both and at the same time. And I think there's something I took from talking to you, Kim, um, Professor Bassford, about how working at the small, at what seems to be the small, is not only good for democracy, it's good for the person who's doing the fight, right? Like Patsy Mink, you said, drew a lot of her. Um, energy from the ability to connect with her constituents and know what was going on in her town, right? That's very true. I mean, she worked at the levels of Congress, but then she also worked at the city council um, in Honolulu, you know, when she lost her uh, bid for Senate. And she was very happy there. I mean, she got a lot of strength from talking to the people in her community and knowing what was going on on the ground. And also, just, I mean, I think she always believed that every voice counted. Um, and and that, yeah, that's really what motivated her was her constituents, was the people here in Hawaii and, and wanting to represent them and their interests. Right, right. And so it takes me back to you, Shannon. So what are the small ways in which your work has changed your everyday life? Like, how do you experience this shift from being anxious to not being overwhelmed anymore, but being fully absorbed, you know? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm still anxious. I mean, Trump is still the president. I don't think I'll be over that until he's gone. But, um, well, for instance, I worked uh, registering voters at a naturalization ceremony in downtown San Diego. And it was so gratifying to sign these people up. And in each case, and again, they were tra they trained us to do this, but we had really meaningful conversations with each of these new voters and stressed on the importance of voting and why they're doing it. And I, I just left there just... Beaming. I mean, I felt so great signing up these people. And there were, it was interesting because um, there was a Democratic Party tent and a Republican Party tent. And there were probably 35 volunteers on the Democrat side and five on the Republican side. And as all the people come out, you know, everybody kind of descends on them. And we had people, <laughs> well, you know, oh my God. and we were, we had people lining up to. Uh, register and they had stressed with us, make sure you have a real conversation. Don't just take down their stuff like they're, you know, signing up to buy mm. something. And I really like that approach. And so we sat and talked and, and then at the very end, you know, they had sign them, they give them their little certificate. And I just felt like, okay, I am doing something. I am registering voters. They will, they are voices of democracy. So that's the one thing. And the other thing I'm working directly for a candidate and talking to them. And again, but the training I had was all about, at least in the early stages, get them to commit to vote. Don't give a whole laundry list of progressive agenda. That, that will turn people off. And they have me talking to what they call low propensity voters. You know, if, the way that they've targeted this, and if Democrats voted in the primary here, they're not bothering with them because they figure they'll get them in November. They're talking to, they have me talking to people either registered as declined to state or Democrats who haven't voted in midterms in the past. So people they think they can bring in. So it's been so interesting, you know, when talking to some people and finding out the misconceptions about government. I had one guy tell me, well, I can't vote for a Democrat for Congress because Gavin Newsom's going to win for governor here in California. I'm like, and why is that a problem? Well, I need conflict. I can't have, you know, like, we're trying to explain the difference between state government and federal government. But again, deep breath, just calmly explaining the differences and not just, you know, berating him for being ill-informed. <laughs> that, that's helpful. Not berating people. Good for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I but so. I mean, I'm curious too about like, what is it when you walk away from those conversations that, you know, has shifted in you? You know, because, I mean, part of this is about, yeah, you're helping people move from unlikely voter to more likely voter, from yes. unregistered to registered. But, you right. know, I think there's something about people, um, like all of us in this conversation, it's so easy to feel overwhelmed. It's so easy to feel like these are very small things that will never add up. Um, and that kills the spark inside of us. You know, it killed what Professor Moody Turner said, um, Anna Julia Cooper called that singing something in the soul yes, that pushes yes, us. So yes. how do we, you know, what has changed in you? 
Um, I just feel like I'm contributing. You know, I spent the majority of my professional career as a journalist, and this kind of thing was not okay to do professionally. But now that I've literally handed in my press pass, and I'm now you know, free to express myself and reach out and try and bring people into this process, I just feel like I'm doing the right thing. I, I, I just feel like I'm doing the right thing. I mean, and there's a way in which, you know, this is about electoral politics, which was Patsy Mink's domain, right? Mm -hmm. This is about, you know, the work you're doing is at this point about the bipartisan fight for control of, you know, our our government institutions. Um, But there's a way in which there's something deeper. And that's what I like about, you know, Professor Fox's work um, is that democracy isn't just in electoral politics, right? So Professor Fox, like, what are you hearing in this conversation that connects to your own research and like how you've seen other women in other times try to live democracy, even when the institutions were in trouble? Right. I mean, if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, part of it may be, um, just relationships, right? So how, how does, um, how, how is freedom, how is, our kind of equity and justice lived and felt by different groups. Um, and so a lot of the thinkers that I am dealing with, um, Elizabeth Keckley is one, she will um, think about her relationship, write about her relationship to Mary Todd Lincoln. So of course, that we're still on the edge there of electoral politics, but she's really interested in, um, you know, their relationship and, challenging through her her own memory, her use of her memory, her use of silence, kind of pushing back against um, Mary Todd Lincoln's narrative that they are kind of always equal and always friends and coming to the table with the very same things. And so when we read Keckley's work, we can kind of think about how um, how power exists on that plane between these two women who do have things in common, right? But their relationship to, um, you know, capitalism, to um, to power is different. And we have to be honest about those differences if we are going to move forward. So I like that in your storytelling, in your, it sounds like in your um, information sharing and kind of consciousness raising, that there's a possibility for exchange um, and maybe kind of pushback. And I think, you know, we live in a moment where democracy, I feel like there's this emphasis that um, you can't have critique, right? That that democracy should not involve critiquing. Um, And so I think relationships are one of the levels in which that that, um, we can challenge that, right? Critique is necessary to the democratic difference, is necessary to the democratic project. And so um, I like that. I like that I'm hearing that you're maybe building potential relationships um, in that way. Yes. And also, and this is what's been a little awkward, but ultimately fruitful is redefining some of the relationships I've had with people I've known for a long time. Um, parents of the friends of my kids, for instance, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. And I'm always respectful. And when they ask me what I'm doing now, and I can tell like, immediately <laughs> when I tell them what I'm doing, either they're, you know, for it, or there's this kind of tenseness and stuff. And I'm, very respectful, but then I go back to this thing, well, it just, right now, we're just looking for to get you to commit to vote. But in some time, cases, you know, I've talked to a dad who hasn't voted in 10 years, and he agrees with me politically, and, you know, we can talk about events of the day, and we have a lot in common, but he hasn't registered to vote. Like, why is that? How could you have not registered to vote in 10 years? And, well, I moved up here 10 years ago, and I never changed my registration. So, getting him signed up and getting his wife, who is an, an immigrant, um, became a naturalized citizen, getting her registered to vote, and their 19-year-old son. So that's three people right there. It's like, okay, that family is now going to vote. Whatever. They may not always agree with me, but that's not important. What I want them to do is engage and when take I, responsibility for their vote. And, and, you know, something I'm remembering from Patsy Mink's life story is how her home communities, right, Kim, on growing up in those plantation settings where there was a direct sense of connection and responsibility, that informed Mm -hmm. her politics. Do you want to say a word about that and then I'll come back to relationships? I think this is really important. Well, no, yes, and I love that, you know, we're talking about relationships because I think that's something happening on the plantation, you know, they did have these one-to-one relationships where they knew everyone, but then sort of branching out, I feel like even when she went to Congress, she was all about building relationships. I mean, she was the very first 
woman of color in the U.S. Congress, but she immediately reached out to the other women. And at that time, I mean, they were they were Republican women and Democratic women, but you know they were very much a minority. And so they could they could connect with one another, and they did. Um, they didn't agree on every issue, but on certain issues, um, you know, like when they were trying to protest the fact that the congressional gym was an all male. Um, mm -hmm institution, right? So they could they could connect with one another. And she was really all about also reaching out and building relationships with other, well, other progressives, of course. Um, and she was very close to a lot of the congressional members, um, progressive African-American congressional members, and actually a lot of people of color who were in Congress at the time. But she also reached out to Republicans. And I have this real sense that people respected her. I mean, I, I did, when I did the film, I really was making a concerted effort to try and not just interview, obviously, um, the progressives and the Democrats, but reach out to Republicans. And, and they had really, um, you know, they definitely said they didn't agree with her, but they respected her. And they knew that she was always going to hold them accountable. I mean, that was the thing they said um, about her, and which I really admired. And, and so, yeah, you know, she, she was able to sort of um, build these personal relationships um, at, at all levels. And I, you know, some of the thread I'm picking up on that I know is sort of implicit, Shannon, because you and I come from sort of, we both have sort of a similar social position. We're both white, highly educated, middle class, you know, citizens. And that's different. Not everyone has this, but I wonder in how many of our relationships have politics or struggle altogether been bracketed? Like, just don't talk about that. That's don't, don't bring it up. That might disturb someone's, you know, Sunday barbecue, you know, <laughs> and like how the work you're doing um, it moves you to a different place where you want relationships with more authenticity and openness, even if there is, as you know, Rita said, room for pushback, room for struggle, room to be more clear that your seamstress is not your friend and yeah. they are still working yeah. for you. Like we right. live with so many silenced social distinctions that we're all supposed to ignore to get along. And I think that's an impediment to democracy. Yeah. Well, I'm really kind of struggling with this because I, by changing how I present myself, um, you know, it, the lines have changed. And I've mm -hmm. had a situation where I needed to do some canvassing in the neighborhood for an event coming up where my candidates will be here to talk to neighbors. And I always walk with someone. And I, you know, all the other times I'd been partnered with somebody from the campaign. And for this one day, nobody could go. And I really wanted to go on my own. So I asked, you know, my family members, and none of them wanted to, because that's to them, it's, that's not what they wanted to do. You know, they agree with me politically, but they just didn't want to be out there knocking on doors and changing their relationships with people who, you know, we have a variety of uh, voters and opinions here. And I respected that. I didn't want to, you know, make them do my thing. It's, it's, we have our home and our neighbors and friends who have, you know, all different political views. So it's, it's a delicate balance because I don't want to um, alienate people who we've been friends with for a long time. But I also am clear about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So it's just finding that balance. And we were just this weekend, we were at a dinner party of longtime friends, and they had some people we had never met before. And this one woman went off about why she voted for Trump and how, you know, big government and how horrible it would have been for Hillary. And it was all I could do not to just, rah! but again, I'm a guest in someone's home. And so it just kind of walked her back about, well, what is it about big government that you well, you know, what are you talking about? Well, you know, this, that, and the other. And then I just realized, she's, I'm not going to change her mind, and I don't want to ruin the evening. But I found out later that another friend of mine who was at the party had a chat with her later and hadn't heard our conversation, and she got into it, you know, pretty heavily with this person. And so I guess they have to take responsibility for their views as well and be able to, you know, stand up to people who disagree with them. But it does affect the social... Um, nicety of the evening I will say that oh yeah well it's like during your interview yeah well it's like during your interview you said you know you there are children of children of friends of your children right and families yeah. in your neighborhood whose kids were the ones at school yelling the terrible build the wall things after the election you know it makes us say like what has passed for a good relationship in our communities if these are not relationships where we can hold each other accountable on human rights issues or you know like are our relationships right. You know, if the work changes you, it's going to change your relationships as well, right? Yes, yes. And then just to clarify, the, the people who were yelling that, the kids who were yelling that were not kids who I knew. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I know of them, but they're not they're not our family friends. And in that case, I think it was up to my 
boys to stand up and they did, you know, they, yeah. they didn't put up with that. And I don't know exactly what happened, but they took some pride in how they responded to that when they came back and told them about it. So I, I don't choose to be, well, another case we had, um, my mother-in-law was visiting and she had an old friend visit her who hasn't, um, she hadn't seen in 20 years and the woman's been living in South Carolina and she started in as a Trump supporter. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this woman's a guest in my home. She's spending the night. And so we just, I told her what I was doing and why and why I felt it was so important. And she's like, well, you know, I, I just disagree with you. So we'll just have to dis, you know, agree to disagree. And in that case, I agree. Because, you know, again, she was a guest, my mother-in-law in our home. But I have to think that it something got through to her, spending that much time with us and seeing how we live and why we believe what we do, that maybe it'll affect her and she'll think twice about supporting Trump. I don't know. But all you, can do is, you can't hide away from what you think. But it's yeah. hard to be like, blatantly opposed to what you think. Well, and I've talked to so many women who are afraid and who hold back because they don't want to upset anybody. So I wonder, you know, what lessons can we take from, I'm not saying you're that person, Shannon, you are challenging, you know, your boundaries and the fabric of your neighborhood by being who you are. So I wonder what lessons that we can take from like Patsy Mink, um, you know, Kim, how would Patsy coach us through these difficult moments? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I wish I knew. I mean, I think she would, she would say, you know, be involved in whatever way works for you, right? And so if it, if it is volunteering and getting the vote out or if it's um, just talking with your family about difficult issues, if it's creating art. I mean, I think she would, she would say, you know, start small, start with what you know and where you are in your local community and, and build from there. Um, yeah, I think, I think she would, I mean, she would definitely encourage participation at, at any level. Um, and then, and then just kind of challenge people to then build more. So participate where you can locally and then, and then maybe go bigger and go bigger, but starting small, I think she would say. Did she have any, would she have any specific advice for how to deal with people who are staying at your house who vote in ways you don't like? <laughs> I don't know. I think she would engage them. In, I mean, I don't know. I think she would try to find common ground. Uh -huh. uh, you know, maybe so, maybe don't talk about the politics first. Talk about something that you can connect with them on something else um, and then kind of maybe venture. <laughs> um, once you kind of establish that, that relationship, that common ground, and then maybe venture into the areas where mm -hmm. there are more differences well, and challenges. Exactly. And even showing her, like in our case, you know, my husband is still a full-time journalist. So for her to spend time with us and realize that we are not the enemy of the people, well, maybe that mm -hmm. will affect her thinking when she goes back to her group. You know, that's what I hope is that she can just see how we live and what, what we think and that we're not, you know, we don't have horns on our heads. It's terrible demons or something that, that we really care about our country and we may disagree on the politics and the other thing all of this stuff about John McCain was so fascinating to me about how much respect people of all political beliefs have for McCain and then how Trump handled it I think that did more for our side than anything because it was so clear you know one is a patriot and one is not in my yeah. sense what patriotism stands for uh, Professor Fox Regis, will you, you know, maybe the same question from your cast of characters that you study from your distinguished African American women who lived in that gap and had to negotiate and do pushback all the time. How do you live and interact with people who won't see you and who, yeah. you know, who, with whom you do not share a political reality in a way that's loving but challenging that actually builds a relationship? It's so tricky. I, I mean, I admire part of why I admire someone like Anna Julia Cooper is she could toe that line very carefully. So on the one hand, I think civility as a, you know, as a discourse is so problematic and usually certain bodies are marked as uncivil, right? And so when we tell people to be polite and, you know, don't hurt feelings, we often, those charges work against certain groups more than others. And so um, she would she would be talking to women, Angela Cooper would be talking to women in, um, you know, the kind of women's movement of her era um, and say, don't use your kind of etiquette rules against me, right? Don't tell me um, that I need to stay in my place or be smaller or take up less room, right? So she would really challenge um, that wielding, right, of affect to kind of police certain groups. Huh. Um, at the same time that she she put forward this need for mutual respect 
yeah. um, for one another? And how can we respect each other in a way that promotes broader sociopolitical awareness? And so I don't know how she she did both at the same time. Um, uh, and so she she didn't say that you had to be respectable, right? But she she was arguing for this kind of mutual accountability to one another um, for these kind of greater ideals of justice. And so it's just a fine, a fine line. Um, I don't know that I can do it the way yet, the way that she did it. And, um, but I think it's that I, I think Kim said it about accountability that has to be at the kind of root of it. And we all have to make sacrifices. Right. Um, and so Shannon, I think to your point, right. We may lose friends, right. We may lose, lose acquaintances, um, and, and, you know, others may, others opinions of us may shift when we stand for certain things. So what are, what are we all willing to sacrifice for that kind of greater good, I think is, and it will be different for each one of us on this conversation even, right, of, of what we're willing to, to give up. But I think we're going to have to give something up. Those of us that have a certain class status or, or maybe racial status or some of that, we're going to have to give something up, I think, to get where we're trying to go. And I like what you said about Anna Julia Cooper saying, you know, don't make me take up less space. I can be polite. I can be respectful, but I will be, and I will say, and I will be as big as I actually am, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think what gets so harmful, and, and certainly Patsy Mink was someone who was big, <laughs> small in stature, but just a big presence, right? So it's when the rules make us smaller just so we get along, that is so damaging. When they make us feel like we need to recede and not speak and not hold other people accountable, because you can do that respectfully, right? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, what do you think, Kim? What, well, when yeah, I mean, she, I mean, she, Patsy Mink was really, I, I mean, she just, was so adept at doing that, right? I mean, she people would talk about her coming up to them, you know, and she was very small, stature wise, but she would just put her finger in people's chest and really like, <laughs> you know, tell them how she felt. I mean, and I mean, I don't know, I think maybe it evolved. I think when she first got to Congress, maybe she wasn't doing that right away, right? She, she built those relationships, she built up a reputation. And definitely by the time she was there in the 1990s um, into when she, you know, passed away in 2002. She was, she was very confident in doing that. But um, she, I don't know, she she ha she mentored a lot of women in her office and I talked to a lot of them as well, what they learned from her. And they said, you know, she she was a mentor and she would tell them, you know, just just act like you belong or, you know, just act like um, you just got to have chutzpah. She would have all these wonderful things to them. But really, I think at the bottom of it was encouraging them to hold their ground, to be there, to be present and not make themselves smaller. And I think that she was trying to encourage other women to do that. And I don't really know how she did it herself. I mean, that was the thing I was trying to figure out. Like, where does, where does she get all of this um, just confidence from? But, but yeah. For sure. I mean, I love that, that phrase, you know, um, don't make me take up less space. Patsy Mink was very much about, you know, I'm here. I I have something to say. I have a voice. I have people I'm representing. And and I'm going to be respectful about it, but I'm not going to back down. Yeah. All right. Closing thoughts from each of you. We'll finish with Shannon. So your one your one takeaway and um, piece of encouragement to the women and men who'll be and women and men and non-binary people, all the people who will be listening um, about um, the lessons that we can take from our past, from the examples of these women and and apply into this moment. I would say that um, getting out and talking to people about issues like this, is not nearly as frightening as and intimidating as I thought it would be. And I realized just from my own life, you know, as a journalist, I could ask people and did ask people what they thought all the time. But I, I, it was easy in a way to never show how I felt. I mean, that was professional standard and it was an easier way to go. Now I'm engaged in with what I think too and trying to shape um, their thoughts um, in reaction to what I present. And it's really satisfying. Um, you know, not everybody's just going to go, oh, yes, I agree with you 100%. But if they're open to it and they're considering, if they have an open mind, if they are frustrated with the way things are and that there is a way to change and there is, we do have the tools to do that. And in, in this case, it's flipping the House, frankly, and hopefully the Senate 
to stand up to Trump and that it's it's not hopeless and engaging. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little scary to knock on doors sometimes and, and start conversations with strangers. But so many people have thanked me. They've thanked me for asking them and reaching out to them and engaging them that it, um, it's worth it. It's 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 worth the fight. And we'll know in November <laughs> whether it paid off. But it's not going to stop me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm only going to do more for 2020 than I'm doing now. But I, I encourage people to get out there and, and engage in this. Professor Fox, your final takeaway from all this? Oh, my mind is spinning. I think that that last um, exchange, I think, was so rich. So I'll just say maybe the not taking up, you know, not, refusing to not take up space, you know, sometimes that means um, saying no, um, you know, so, you know, using your counter memory, refusing certain narratives, um, of who we are, right? That we're, we were once great, we're not great, whatever, you know, these, these narratives that are being put forward, refusing that, um, and, you know, asserting your counter memory to that, right? Of your experience, um, and your knowledge and your, your kind of worldview using that to kind of push back. I think silence is sometimes a way of, of, um, taking up space in a different, in a different way. And so how can we, um, kind of challenge the way that uh, we're typically read by, you know, taking up space in alternate ways, I think, um, is part of it, is part of it. I love it. Okay, final word, Professor Basford. Well, I think maybe just that we all have something to contribute. I mean, I'm so inspired hearing, you know, this conversation, and they were all contributing in different ways. We have this podcast. We have these books examining history. We have films. We have actually going and volunteering our time. Um, and so, you know, we each have something to contribute, and it may be different, but um, but that you should contribute, and you should believe in the um, value of your contribution. Because the doing changes you, right? The <laughs> yes, doing, I mean, exactly. we have no guarantee about how any of this is going to turn out. We have none. Right. But at least we can live with mm -hmm. our with dignity and with courage and refusing to be small. And that feels better. Oh, maybe I'm a poor girl. Hey, thank you for listening to American Beauty. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate and review at iTunes. Special thanks to our cross promotional sponsors, Women Make Movies and the University of Florida Press publishers of Regis Fox's latest book, Resistance Reimagined. Brightness, world comes crashing down. I know that I'll be standing tall.